Hey everyone, it's Pacific, as always. Just a few quick messages before I get into this week's episode. First up, new postcard designs are coming out soon. I'm tirelessly working away at them as we speak. And second, I want to give a big shout out to this week's patrons. David Potter, Liar, Ryan Cook, Jendra Grubb, B Ponder 182123, Jennifer Pfaff. And, as always, if you're interested in hearing your name at the beginning of the show, or in getting access to ad free episodes or bonus episodes, or even picking your own bonus episode, make sure you find us at patreon.com slash scp underscore pod. And now, this week's episode. Warning, the Foundation database is classified. Unauthorized access will result in detainment. Within this archive, you'll find the procedures, descriptions, and accounts of the most notorious anomalies we've encountered to date. Secure. Contain. Protect. Item number, SCP-610. Object class, Keter. Special containment procedures. Due to the vast area of infection SCP-610 covers, containment is impossible. Isolation of the area has proved far more effective and permission has been granted by the Russian government to establish a perimeter to keep people out of these areas under the guise of military operations. Should any organism displaying traits consistent with SCP-610 be sighted near this perimeter, then the established protocol requires it be engaged at range with small arms until immobile then dispatched using incendiary weapons and munitions from as great a distance as possible. Any living thing coming in physical contact with an organism infected with SCP-610 is considered expendable. It is to be immediately terminated and incinerated. Any persons coming within three meters of SCP-610 infected life are to immediately withdraw from the area, be isolated from the rest of their team, and subjected to medical examination using only remote techniques to determine if infection has incurred and appropriate steps taken based on that determination. At present, the known infection vectors for SCP-610 spread seem to be focused on physical contact. Drone movements within heavily infected areas have returned air samples containing minute particles which when exposed to organic compounds will result in the spread of SCP-610. The results of these particular tests have revealed that most require several days to manifest, if at all, with the exception of direct contact with exposed lung and liver tissue. These particular tests show a rapid rate of growth which requires incineration of the testing environment no more than 24 hours after initial exposure, with even a two-hour mishap risking a compromised facility event. Given that this kind of rapid growth only occurs in organic material existing outside the human body, this form of infection is currently considered a minor concern. These peculiarities have given rise to a series of questions regarding the possible origin of the infection in conjunction with the failed and no concern for transmission via water or air at infection parameters exist barring situational changes in the field. Description Initial reports of SCP-610 came direct from the Russian government through undisclosed channels. These reports consist primarily of disappearances of farmers in the region and were not considered until the local police followed by the regional police, and finally a government dispatched agent all failed to report in within a 72-hour period. A small military contingent was dispatched to the area and quickly withdrew, at which point the Foundation was contacted to investigate. The area SCP-610 affects is close to Lake Bacall in southern Siberia. Areas of known infection are marked on the map provided to us. Containment parameters are marked in blue surrounding these infection areas, and as of present, no further locations have been identified. Incursions into the perimeter must be reported prior to conducting, confirmed during exploration, and debriefed on immediately following return. SCP-610 appears to be a contagious skin disease at first with symptoms including rash, itching, and increased skin sensitivity. Within three hours, the disease will cause blemishes resembling heavy scar tissue to form in the chest and arm areas, spreading to the legs and back within an additional hour, consuming the victim completely within five hours. Exposure to higher temperatures vastly decreases the time for the contagion to spread, and complete infections have been recorded occurring in as little as five minutes. After the completion of the infection occurs, the victim's life functions will cease for approximately three minutes, after which time they will restart at two to three times the activity rate of a normal human. Following this, 
The scar tissue of the victims will start to move of its own accord and grow at a rapid rate. Normal human features start to disappear at this point under the infection, and the path of mutation appears to be largely random. Subjects observed in this stage of infection have been recorded as growing three or more limbs of a type such as arms or legs. The head may become misshapen and elongated or widened out, and parts of the subject may split open from which additional branches of flesh will grow. The duration of this stage of infection is unknown, and not all subjects appear to progress to the later stages. Under unknown conditions, an infected individual will cease moving and place itself in a location it deems suitable where it roots itself. The fleshy growth on the victim will then begin to spread itself across all surrounding objects and consume them. Such objects do not spread the infection as living creatures do, and the effect of prolonged contact with these objects is recorded later in this document. It is assumed that this behavior is to create an area hospitable to continue growth of the other infected. Observation of life infected by SCP-610 by staff is impossible. Those infected with the disease immediately seek out aid as natural human impulse resulting in unattended infections. Those infected past the scar tissue phase actively and aggressively attempt to infect anyone approaching them within an undefined area. It has been established that should an infected be capable of sight and observed as uninfected, it will proceed towards them. If the infected has lost the ability of sight, a range of approximately 30 meters is considered safe. Observation of SCP-610 infected settlements have been established using artificial methods such as remote robots. The data returned from these observations, coupled with the openly aggressive nature of the infected, to attempt to spread SCP-610 has resulted in the Keter classification. However, so long as nothing is allowed to enter or leave the infected areas, it is considered a neutralized threat. Of concern are the cavernous areas beneath the infected settlements that were discovered during the exploration. Attempts to get research personnel into these areas are underway. Document SCP-610-L1 After establishing the containment perimeter for SCP-610, the Russian government improved our request to research and investigate the area. For the first such exploration, a small camera-mounted unit known as a Kirby was dispatched at a safe distance and directed towards Site A. Herbie has a battery life of 12 hours and a control range far wider than that required for this dispatch. Herbie is able to enter Site A without incident. The landscape around Site A shows early stages of assimilation by singular SCP-610 infected who have fallen at largely random intervals around what remains of the village. Many of the homes appear to have suffered fire damage long since put out. However, a fair amount remain intact. Aerial reconnaissance of Site A combined with thermal imaging has put it at an estimated population of 79 infected. Immobile infected are included in this number. However, it is difficult to ascertain an exact percentage of mobile versus immobile. Varying degrees of physical mutation due to SCP-610 are present in Site A, and it is assumed that all the inhabitants are in advanced stages of infection. Herbie observed the exterior of the village for two hours, during which time all infected behaved with what appeared to be a loose sense of social structure. Because Herbie remained stationary during this observation period, it is unknown precisely what each individual infected person was doing. However, the central plaza experienced occasional bursts of activity in downtime. Requiring more information, Herbie was directed to follow an infected as it entered a home. There was a bumpy camera feed as Herbie scoots over the gravel behind the quickly shambling infected person. The interior of this home is the same as that attached to the primary file for SCP-610. The infected being tailed is the one sitting at the table. After entering the home, Herbie's camera was raised slowly as to not draw attention. This action was either unnoticed or ignored. The infected person is watched from the doorway as it hobbles around the home and stops at each of the other visible infected organisms. However, it appears to ignore the one under the table which, while not immobile, does not leave that area. What this creature was before infection is... unclear. After lapping the table and repeating this procedure three times, primary infected person, known as Alpha henceforward, stops at the bedridden infected, known as Beta. 
and proceeds to assault it with furious punches. Beta is unable to leave the bed for unknown reasons, but is not completely immobile as it flails its arms in response to the beatings delivered by Alpha. After several sustained minutes of this beating, a piercing sound explodes from the area around Beta, who then proceeds to project a cloud of unknown matter into the air from its chest cavity. Alpha lingers in the cloud as it floats in the air around them, slowly descending to the ground. The unknown life form on the table beside Beta begins to twitch in an apparent seizure, and Alpha then laps the room twice more, stopping again at each infected organism, but still ignoring the one under the table, as well as Beta now. After these two laps, Alpha seats itself at the table and reaches out to position the three plates atop it, as if setting a dinner set. After the plates are positioned, the facial tendrils extending from Alpha wiggle off and start to coil on one of the plates before tearing apart and separating. This is repeated at each plate. The image attached to SCP-610's primary file is a still image of this occurrence. After each plate is filled with Alpha's flesh, it leaves the table and approaches Herbie, which is moved from Alpha's path. Alpha leaves the home but Herbie's camera remains focused on the table. After several minutes, a group comprised of six to seven infected enter the room from outside, still ignoring Herbie. Each infected shambles as if movement is difficult, jerking in large steps or squirming in small ones. These infected all surround the table, and each takes turns grabbing handfuls of the flesh substance left behind by Alpha pressing it into whatever orifices on themselves that they can. Some into mouths, some into the chest, some behind their backs, some under the arms. When all the plates are empty, this group leaves. Irby remains here for several more minutes before retracting its camera and leaving. Immediately after leaving the home, Irby collides with an object. Banning the camera around the obstruction appears to be Alpha, whose facial tendrils are intermingling with another infected having similar mutations. The impact is ignored, and the two infected part ways after several minutes. Herbie is then directed to explore more areas of the village. The remains of what appears to have been a store show signs of severe fire damage as well as activity inside the building, which Herbie moves to investigate. The door is slightly ajar, and with firm movements of Herbie, it is pushed open. No notice is taken of this action, or it is ignored. Inside the store are several infected persons, most of whom are standing around. However, one is on the ground, rolling back and forth over the space of approximately 0.3 meters, one foot, and is ignored by the others. Herbie rolls under the divider separating the cashier area from the customer area and pans around behind the counter. The upper half of a person is protruding from the cellar door behind the counter. This person does not appear to be suffering from advanced infection and wears the garb of a Russian soldier. Herbie zooms the camera in to confirm identification, and it is noticed the eyes of this person are in constant movement, often focusing on Herbie. The rest of the soldier does not move. Herbie is directed to leave this area and proceeds to the back room. In this storage area, a large pile of bodies are stacked together. Some pieces of clothing are visible, and appear to contain both military garb and everyday clothing. No facial features are discernible on any of the bodies due to the way they are stacked. Atop the bodies, an infected sits, appearing to have its lower parts fused to the pile, and with its upper half in a wild state of flailing and seizure. Approximately every 10 seconds, a burst of spores flies out the top of this infected, which linger in the air. Herbie is directed to leave the building. After leaving this building, Herbie passes by the village well, surrounding which are a series of immobile infected all facing the well. The arms of each of these infected persons are stretched out, one in contact with the next, forming a perfect chain save for one whose arms are down at its sides. Herbie passes by this last infected to approach what appears to have been a town hall or a mayor's building when the infected becomes mobile and snatches the rover up. 
Video feed from Herbie focuses on the face of the infected, which is strangely in perfect shape given the condition of the rest of its body, which is horribly bloated. This infected was once a young girl from appearance, age estimated 10 to 12. Herbie is rolled side to side in its grip as its face stares motionless at the rover. The infected's face suddenly balloons in size and explodes outward into a series of fleshy flaps that grip Herbie and draw it inside. Herbie's video feed terminates here. Herbie was considered lost at this point. However, no one at control remembered to turn off the video feed, assuming it cut. Five hours later, Herbie's video feed resumed, stationary and at a raised level pointing at the upper rim of the village well. The video feed contains some blur due to what appears to be a slimy film which often oozes across the lens, but when not obscured provides perfect quality recording. Irby does not respond to any remote commands, but its video jerks back and forth from target to target, zooming in and out of its own accord. Video feed is cut manually, and all connections to Herbie's unit are ordered erased. SCP-610-L2 During construction of the perimeter surrounding SCP-610's containment area, several Class D personnel were infected due to assaults from infected villagers or animals roaming the area. In addition to a number of infections as a result of escape attempts and careless behavior, most of these infected personnel were immediately destroyed with flamethrowers. However, a small collection of infected were contained in cold storage units, which prolonged the inevitable progression of SCP-610's mutative properties. The decision was made to utilize some of these infected personnel as video relays and dispatch them into nearby sites. Due to the concern over loss of equipment as evidenced in SCP-610-L1, all three subjects that were used in this manner were sent in with a single video system to Site C. Additional equipment issued for this dispatch include a one-gallon container of gasoline, three emergency flares, three nine-millimeter pistols with three magazines of ammo each, three single-serving food rations. The infected personnel were instructed to observe and avoid interaction with the infected villagers as long as possible. But, should a situation arise where they are met with aggression or feel they are losing themselves to SCP-610's influence, they are free to kill as many infected villagers as they so choose and do as much damage to infected objects and property as possible while maintaining video feed. The intent of this order was to provide data of SCP-610 infected communities in a raid situation so a plan of eradication could be better established. At the time of this expedition, Site-C was suspected to be a possible origin point for SCP-610, having far fewer mobile infected than other sites, as well as structures which appear to have been layered over several times with the terraforming effects of the immobile infected. Dispatched Class D personnel, known henceforth as DI-1, DI-2, and DI-3, were directed to pay particular attention to anything that could be considered an origin point for SCP-610. The trek from our perimeter camp to Site-C was uneventful. There is no evidence of any native animal life in the area. As Site-C is approached, there is a noticeable rise in the temperature within the last 30 meters of the trip that necessitates removal of the heavy cold-based coverings that were provided. The temperature rises again sharply at the entrance to Site-C proper, which requires a further shedding of garments for fear of heat stroke. Temperatures within Site C are described as being heavily humid and around 32 degrees Celsius, 89 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the first immediately noticed traits about Site C is an array of immobile pylons which encircle what is believed to be the entirety of the site. Separated by an apparent distance of 5 to 6 meters, each pylon appears to be 2 to 4 infected persons fused together in one spot. On some of these pylons, features such as faces or anuses are still visible in addition to several other holes which do not naturally occur, all appearing to act as heat vents. Where the heat is generated is unknown. Current belief is that this is an advanced stage of SCP-610 terraforming its environment to facilitate spread of itself. 
DI-2, who was furthest along in progression of SCP-610 of the three by a number of hours, begins to seizure after only a few minutes in Site C during examination of the pylons. The progression to the scar tissue phase of SCP-610 infection is observed in full course as DI-2 spasms on the ground, his entire body being overtaken by the sticky tan flesh almost entirely after 45 seconds. DI-2 is terminated by a gunshot from DI-1 and his equipment left where it is. The spread of SCP-610 over DI-2 continues even after death of the body until all movement ceases. As perimeter control is relaying new instructions to DI-1 and DI-3 regarding this situation, there is a shift in the grounds covering in Site C where DI-2's body is. Video feed shows the flesh-like growth splitting open beneath his body and a series of ropey tendrils coming from within the gap to pull his corpse inside. This opening closes up quickly. Total time elapsed, three seconds. As DI-1 and DI-3 decide to act quickly in these hotter temperatures fearing the same fate, they proceed to the village center and encounter another previously unknown phenomenon. In the precise center of town rising above what was the community well is a sphere surrounded by angled supports comprised of SCP-610 flesh. This ball is riddled with the features of humans in early stages of SCP-610 infection as well as a good number assumed to be in late stages. A number of specimens of non-human life forms such as deer and bears are also visible within the mass. The entire sphere of flesh pulses at roughly a five-second interval and with each pulse emits a ring of spore-like materials from its equator. This material floats to the ground and appears to be absorbed into the converted environment. DI-3 begins to douse the sphere with the provided gasoline and when questioned by a panicking DI-1, explains this looks like as good a thing to burn as any. At this point, perimeter control has ceased giving commands due to the rapid deterioration of events. There is no reaction from anything within Site C to any of this activity until the precise moment at which a lit emergency flare is applied to the spherical mass, which immediately goes up in flames. The remote feed plays back a noise from an unknown location that seems to come from a location far outside of Site C, but was reported as being heard even at perimeter control by both Site C and A. This noise is described as both explosive, as if multiple high-yield charges were detonated on a mountainside, and alive, like a large feral creature roaring. Within 15 seconds following the sound's dissipation, Site A reported that a series of explosions had occurred within the village. Five seconds after this report, the spherical mass in the middle of Site C explodes. DI-1 and DI-3 are thrown by the blast. DI-3 is confirmed deceased by DI-1 after regaining his footing, having suffered injury from stone shrapnel from the well. DI-1 is able to report he has bruises and ringing ears, but aside from the rapidly spreading SCP-610 infection, he suffered no blast damage. During this recording of footage, DI-1 had his video equipment removed and was looking into it. Due to the angle of recording, it is unknown previously what occurred in Site C, but something draws DI-1's attention back to the center of town, where he stares for several moments, then is pulled into the opposite direction, the video equipment falling to the ground and recording in a skyward direction. The last moments of footage from DI-1's video unit display a humanoid figure moving through the air, followed by the sound of an impact in the same direction. Within three seconds of this event, an unknown creature steps upon the recording video equipment and destroys it. Perimeter control remained on high alert for a full 24 hours at all locations without any incident following this event. SCP-610-L3 The destruction caused by the rapid collapse of the Site C exploration attempt during SCP-610-L2 resulted in a series of unexpected events in Site A. As the strange spherical formation in Site C was burned and destroyed, the SCP-610 infected inhabiting Site A were recorded by aerial drones going into seizures and convulsions. 
The immobile SCP-610 infected, rapidly shriveled, and died, along with all of the flesh material spread across inanimate objects within the village. The mobile SCP-610 infected, who were able to regain their footing, all proceeded to what appears to have formerly been an upper-class residence, and entered the building. As the infected entered this dwelling, it suffered a foundational collapse, revealing the presence of a sinkhole beneath it. The size of the hole in relation to the structure above it posed an impossibility for an entire building to collapse, suggesting something within the hole applied force directly to the structure with the intent to pull it inside and expose the hole. The revealed hole is approximately large enough to accommodate three grown men standing shoulder to shoulder. Light sources applied by remote drones fail to penetrate further than four meters depth into the hole. Objects dropped into the hole do not produce an impact sound, suggesting a bottom potentially more than 1,000 meters down. Research of the exterior of the Site A hole was only able to be carried out for two hours' time. Samples of the atmosphere in Site A indicated a complete death of SCP-610-related materials. All infectious life that did not evacuate into the hole died above ground and quickly became shriveled husks. Manned exploration of Site A was approved and commenced immediately. In the span of 30 minutes, a total of three research teams, consisting of two to three research staff and four to five armed escorts, each were dispatched and setting up stations within the remains of the village. Samples of the deceased SCP-610 infected and converted matter were sent back to Perimeter HQ for processing and transport. One team was able to recover a small sample of still-living SCP-610 tissue substance from a building and pack it for research. Within the second hour of exploration of Site A, a series of echo reverberation units were set up surrounding the hole with the intent of getting an accurate mapping of the hole and possible branch tunnels. At the end of this second hour, before the echo units could be activated, seismic activity began to occur within Site A. Two teams of the original three remained on site, the third en route back to Perimeter HQ with samples. The third team was instructed to proceed back to Perimeter HQ when seismic activity began and was told that Site A should not be returned to for assistance. Seismic activity at Site A capped at 2.3 Richter level before petering off. Immediately following the seismic event, a torrent of the SCP-610 spores erupted from the hole and layered the area around it for a span of 50 meters. As all staff on site were in level A hazardous material suits, this spore burst was startling, but did not lead to any infections. As the eruption was being reported, both teams at Site A came under attack from aerial lifeforms infected with SCP-610. These organisms were captured by the remote drone video equipment and showed extremely advanced stages of infection. It is impossible to tell what they mutated from to this present state. Many of the avian creatures attacked by splitting their heads in half and clamping them against research members, pulling them into the air and dropping them into the hole when possible. These avian infected proved vulnerable to small arms fire. In dispatching them, a total of two research staff were lost to the hole and one injured due to crossfire. The injured staff was put down immediately upon showing signs of infection due to his suit breach. Before video and radio contact was lost with the remaining teams inside Site A, a second seismic event began to occur, starting out in the 1 to 1.5 range in scale. Attention was directed at the hole to prepare for a second assault. A second spore burst erupted from the hole during the rising seismic activity. At the point where scales registered a 3 to 3.5 in force, a new, unseen SCP-610 entity began to emerge from the hole. The only footage captured of this creature depicts an engorged human head, approximately 20 times larger than normal, pressing itself out of the hole with no discernible body. Video and radio contact were lost as seismic forces increased to 7 on the scale for 2 seconds duration, then abruptly ceased. Further aerial surveillance of the Site A hole and area depict zero activity and no traces of the research teams or their ever having been there. All personnel and equipment are considered lost. SCP-610-L4 
Events regarding the discovery, research, and handling of SCP-610 rapidly degraded to a point where fail-safe options were being considered. For over one hour, Nothing further had happened at Site A following the loss of research teams during the seismic events in the SCP-610-L3 event, and subsequent contact with previously unseen SCP-610 life forms. With the absence of activity at Site A, a remote drone dispatch was authorized in two parts. The first part would drop a remote relay device at the entrance to the Site A sinkhole, and the second part would dispatch a drone into the hole directly so it may relay its data through the relay and back to HQ. Drones on site were powered by solar energy with the battery maintaining a 4-hour charge. Attached is the video log recovered from the Site A sinkhole drone before its loss. <clears throat> this is Explorative Drone RSCP610-1 coming online. Systems check out. Video confirmed. Feed is good to the relay station. We are testing rotors now and deploying if successful. The sound of a helicopter blade starts up as video feed begins to lift in the air. Camera tilts left and right to test pan features, then directs itself toward the Site A sinkhole. Video feed is go. Engines are go. Things are green. All right. Sending drone down now. Audio from the outside world fades away as camera angles itself down and peers into the darkness within the sinkhole. After approximately two minutes of descent, lights on the drone activate and illuminate a roughly dug shaft. Initially, it is unclear what could have created the hole, but at a glance it would appear the shaft was created by a single event rather than dug over time. At approximately 15 meters descent, there are traces of SCP-610 material attached to the dirt and stuck to rocks. The material is dormant, but retains its texture and appearance, unlike samples from above ground level, which shrivel and dry rapidly. There is a possible connection with this material and the events last recorded during SCP-610-L3. Descent continues. At approximately 100 meters in depth, branch tunnels become visible in the walls of the sinkhole. Panning of the camera reveals small tunnels branching out at apparently random intervals, but which are not restricted to any one side of the hole. These tunnels are considered too small for any useful exploration to occur. Descent continues. Increase in density of SCP-610 materials on walls is noted as depth increases. At approximately 250 meters, the bottom of the sinkhole becomes visible, and the tunnel slopes sharply, suggesting unnatural formation, which was already suspected. Drone video shifts to illuminate this tunnel, and drone proceeds forward through the area. SCP-610 coats entirety of the tunnel now, and care is taken to keep the drone from coming in contact with any surface. Movement is detected approximately 5 meters ahead. Lights on the drone are dimmed, and weapons come online. The RSCP-610 drone is equipped with a 5.56 millimeter machine gun containing 50 rounds of ammo. This is meant to be used to deter wildlife away from the drone and defend against aggression when possible, rather than to dispatch a target although it is fully capable of handling human aggressors in small groups. Camera focus turns to the moving mass of flesh ahead at approximately 3 meters. After focus clears, the movement appears to be coming from what appears to be a deer, uninfected, wriggling in the grips of tendrils composed of SCP-610 material. The deer is being suspended above the ground with unclear intent. The drone is moved past the trapped deer while holding it in view of the camera until safely away. Nothing occurs with the deer, and the drone proceeds past, undisturbed. The previously fairly level ground of the tunnel displays large humps in apparently random placement. Approximately 5 meters ahead of the drone, approximately 30 meters past the encountered deer, 
Upon approach, these lumps turned out to be similar to the infected villagers who escaped from Site A into the sinkhole after the destruction of Site C. The sound of rushing water is now detected, and the drone is pushed forward. Approximately 100 meters further into the tunnel, the sound of running water is now deafening. Drone lights reveal a running stream of water potentially from one of the adjacent rivers in the area. A sample vial is placed in the water, allowed to collect, and then released with an active tracking beacon. Later recovery of this sample indicates no SCP-610 contamination of groundwater. The tunnel splits in two at this point. One tunnel leads around the river and then seems to slope downward, while the other is directly above a light source in the ceiling. This second one is selected to facilitate recovery of the drone. During adjustment of the drone's flight path, it comes in contact with a portion of the tunnel's wall coated in SCP-610, causing a deep gash from the propeller of the drone, which is already healing over when the camera focuses on the impact point. The drone proceeds upwards. Approximately 300 meters of upwards travel, taking approximately 45 minutes, results in the drone emerging into a windy section of a mountain where it is directed to stay low. Camera panning of the area reveals what may have once been a village, long since abandoned. The precise location is unclear, but it is assumed to be in the vicinity of Site B, judging from the estimates in travel by the drone. The buildings here are coated in deceased layers of SCP-610, and unlike other buildings in Site A and Site C which were coated in SCP-610, these buildings appear to be constructed directly from the tissue substance. After a cursory scan of Site B, it is determined there is no life here, either natural or SCP-610 related, so the drone is directed back into the tunnel as the winds around the area make aerial recovery impossible. Upon descent into the tunnel, a deep, roaring sound fills the audio, video feed becomes choppy, as something blocks the signal. During the periods in which connection to the drone is clearest, its camera and weapon are angled downward and propellers slow in speed to allow a faster drop. Video feed becomes entirely clear for the final two minutes before feed is lost. Rushing up toward the drone from the area below is what appears to be a large human face stretched to 20 times its proportions, with no features save those created by the SCP-610 material. There are eye sockets, but no eyes. A mouth, but no teeth. The drone fires upon this rushing mass of SCP-610, but the bullets do not deter it, impact points remaining visible for several seconds before closing over themselves. There is no room in the tunnel for the drone to take evasive action, and it is swallowed by the mass. RSCP-610 is considered lost until three hours later when feed inexplicably returns. Video feed from the drone appears to show a series of structures illuminated by one of the two lights on the drone. The camera pans around without instructions from the remote relays or HQ, capturing a vast number of shambling entities within the area. SCP-610 material moves over the lens of the drone and video feed is permanently severed. SCP-610-L5. Approval from Central HQ was granted for a manned assault excursion into the tunnels beneath Site A to try to ascertain the extent of the SCP-610 infection. The destruction of Site A and Site C have established SCP-610 can be contained and destroyed, making the source of the infection top priority. The initial descent into the tunnels consists of five teams, two research and three assault, along with enough equipment to establish an underground base of operations. Descent into the tunnels was established using pulley systems and a lift to move equipment. Assault teams were the first to descend, armed with flame units to clean SCP-610 out of the area. All teams were able to descend without incident, and flame units took point 
providing an undisturbed journey toward the water source where the RSCP-610 drone was lost. Base camp for underground SCP-610 operations resides at the bottom of a three-way junction, four if the water flows included. The first pathway is that which led from Site A to Cavern HQ. The second is the pathway to the ruined village, residing in the mountains above where RSCP-610 was destroyed by a large, unknown SCP-610 entity. The third pathway heads west, and seems to follow the flow of water for an unknown distance. The cavern area here is quite large, and is supported by a number of rock formations that are coated with decayed SCP-610 material. The state of this material suggests great age, and appears to reinforce the structural supports. Whether or not this is intentional or coincidental is unknown. The two research teams split activities between building Cavern HQ and collecting samples of SCP-610 in various states. No contagious materials were detected within this area, and the creature recorded by unmanned drones did not appear at any point to the cavern staff. Of the four research teams, three were ordered to proceed down the unexplored pathway, while an aerial drone was prepped for a second recon of the vertical shaft. SCP-610 infection did not appear in the third pathway until approximately 3 kilometers, and serious infection did not appear until 16 kilometers in. Even after the lengths traveled by the assault teams, no SCP-610 infectious life forms were encountered, and the fleshy material coating the cavern walls posed no threat to the team. The most significant reports at this time were the increasing thickness of material, suggesting a source and the complete lack of SCP-610 contamination in the water. As a test, a sample of SCP-610 was cut away from the cavern wall and placed in the flow of water. It exhibited no unusual reactions, but was quickly swept away by the current. At 20 kilometers in, the leader of the assault teams requested a transport buggy be dispatched to them. One was available at the above-ground HQ, however it would take time to move it to Cavern HQ and then remote drive it to the teams. Rations provided to the assault teams were sufficient, so a camp was established while the buggy was moved and readied. During this time, an aerial drone was also sent to explore the vertical shaft. The results of this exploration were placed on hold with the arrival of the buggy at Cavern HQ, and ultimately concluded in document. The buggy was navigated to the assault team encampment with no events en route. However, upon arrival and preparation to continue the exploration, the assault teams came under attack by a number of large SCP-610 infected life forms that emerged from the area ahead of them. Video recovered from the assault team cameras show them caught off guard as the SCP-610 infected made no sound and were undetectable. On one film, for one to two seconds, it appears that some of the creatures are coming out of the SCP-610 materials on the wall, not emerging from them so much as being created by the material and then breaking away to act independently. During this assault, in an attempt to protect the buggy, three members were lost to the water currents and contact with them was lost. Contact was regained, however, and is recorded in SCP-610-L6. The remainder of the assault team now consisted of three members, armed with a single flame unit. Use of this unit to repel the assault proved vital, as standard firearms did minimal damage to the infected creatures. These infected creatures show minimal traits to associate them with any known form of life in the region, giving rise to the belief they may have been spawned by the SCP-610 infection itself as a form of defense. No further casualties were suffered during the raid, and the remaining members managed to eliminate all attacking infected, allowing them to continue with exploration with added orders to attempt to locate lost team members. A further 20 kilometers into the tunnel, the river separated from the tunnel pathway, and the team was instructed to abandon the recovery order, given the inability to navigate the waters safely. A total time of 6 hours, 15 minutes, 33 seconds passed before the remaining assault team reached an end in the tunnel. At the perimeter of the area, now known as Site B, 
the team came under assault again from a smaller number of SCP-610 that were much larger in size. These infected appeared in the tunnel as if they were lying in wait for the approaching team. These creatures were dispatched using the flame unit, although all fuel for the unit was expended in this act. The assault team was now limited to standard weapons and short-range personal flame units. A time lapse of five minutes is allowed to pass before the team proceeds farther into Site B, cautious of further assaults by SCP-610 infected. The tunnel widens out into what appears to have once been a village of indeterminate age. The construction of the buildings in this area are primitive compared to the settlements at Site A and Site C, and are of clearly human construction. Many buildings rest at angles or slants, suggesting they were disturbed by a cave-in. Of interest is a building that appears to be a church with a working clock tower. This building is built atop the remains of two older buildings that have fallen completely and has a visibly stable foundation. Surrounding all structures in this area is a depression in the ground filled with a substance resembling a liquefied form of SCP-610 fleshy materials. The pool moves as if acted upon by minute and unseen forces, rippling outward from invisible contact points and rolling in waves from unfelt winds. The team avoids this pool at all times and proceeds through the ruins slowly on stable foundations where possible, making the church their target area. Within the church are pews, as would be expected. However, there are only four, one of them shattered, when the building could accommodate as many as twenty. The three intact pews are arranged in a two-one formation facing a pulpit. There's no trace of dust on any surface, the entire area appearing to be immaculately clean, given the location and believed age. Behind the pulpit is a hole in the floor, exposing an area of the SCP-610 pool beneath the building. The church and ruins appear to be uninhabited, and exploration of the church proper is uneventful until the clock tower bell tolls. This tolling triggers a shudder in the building, followed by human screams from the ceiling. Lights shown upon the ceiling reveal a large mass of SCP-610 from which descend a series of six wooden circles. Strapped to each circle is a living human coated entirely from neck to toe in SCP-610, but having an exposed head which appears uninfected. These human captives scream as the bell continues to toll and the circles move to the ground. The team begins to move toward one to investigate, when an unknown creature cries from outside the building, prompting them to take cover in shadows near the pulpit. Light sources are extinguished, pitching the entire area into darkness. Night vision is left off to avoid revealing the team's location. Sounds continue to emit from the outside of the church, drawing closer but lower than the frantic screams of the captive humans. At least one noticed the team, as the captive humans often call out to be saved. From the entrance to the church, a candle lights on the side of the doorway, then one on the other side. A figure is seen holding a small torch and moving back and forth between a series of candles to light the doorway. The flame is then applied to a rope coated in SCP-610, which quickly ignites and spreads up to a peculiar chandelier system at the church entrance. The light from this system illuminates most of the crosses, but does not reach the team's hiding place. Those captives who appear in the light do not show standard signs of the beige-colored SCP-610 infection, but instead are wrapped in a red variant of it, which shows signs of constant motion rippling across itself in waves. From outside the church, a flood of SCP-610 infected shamble quickly into the area, ignoring the man who lit the candles and stands in the middle of the room. They proceed to the captives on the wooden circles and begin to pull at the red SCP-610 masses, resulting in further screams and cries. From what can be gathered from the return to video feed, the red SCP-610 seems to be connected to the captives and is using them as a source of sustenance that it then uses to grow and feed the normal SCP-610 infected. 
Overly zealous infected tear at the red mass too hard, which results in pulling skin and tissue from the human captive beneath. This exposed area is quickly covered over by the red mass, which then grows in size. Feeding like this continues for approximately six minutes, at which time the candle-bearing figure sounds a gong and all infected entities move to the pews. There are several more creatures than seats, but none move past the frontmost pews. The figure who sounded the gong does not move, spontaneously collapsing as if made from hollow clay. From the pulpit area, activity is noticed as a pillar of SCP-610 flesh rises through the hole and extends, directing itself toward the gathered creatures. No sound is heard, and no motion is recorded once the pillar stops moving. This silent period persists for ten minutes without even the human captives making a sound, having fallen silent at an unknown point. The pillar of SCP-610 retracts back into the hole it emerged from without any warning, prompting the departure of the infected from the building. The candles remain lit, and the team emerges after all infected appear to leave the area. The descended captives remain at ground level as well, all screaming seeming to have ceased, but still showing signs of life with heavy breathing and movement. Upon departure from the church, camera feeds from all three members become erratic. Camera 1 ceases transmitting completely. Camera 2 shoots straight up into the air for several meters. And Camera 3 captures the member with Camera 2 being flung by a tendril that emerges out of the ground itself, swinging them out of sight onto the other side of the ruins. Camera 1's feed is restored and displays Camera 3's owner running briefly in the direction of the lost team member, only to turn and run back as SCP-610 infected pour from between buildings. Combat ensues between the two members and the onrushing infected using assault rifles and personal flame units, successfully driving back enough of the horde to make an escape toward the buggy. Passing by a building, Camera 1's owner is ambushed by a figure resembling the figure who was in the church lighting candles, wielding a large crop scythe. Camera 3's owner continues without pause toward the buggy location. However, the buggy is found half-absorbed by the SCP-610 mass covering the floor. While turning to find another way of escape, Camera 3's owner turns to find the same figure with the scythe approaching, weapon raised. Two shots are fired, and camera feed ends. Five hours later, while final decisions were underway to decide how to contain or eradicate the SCP-610 threat, Time-delayed video feed from the lost team members who fell into the underground river currents was established and has been filed in SCP-610-L6. Our host and narrator was John Grills. Additionally, our other three narrators this week were Atticus Jackson, Nicole Goodnight, and Graham Rowett. Dr. Figgis was played by Jesse Hall. Quality Assurance was done by The Sky Above the Port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. Jimmy Furrer and Daniel Willis. Our music was created by the incredible Tom Rory Parsons. I'm your editor and sound designer, Pacific Obdaya. And our producer is Tom Owen. This is a bloody disgusting show. For more information, visit bloody-disgusting.com.